Tony. I'm glad you could come Good morning, Dr. Lamson. It's uh, still interesting to be coming in here. I'm not really used to this whole concept yet. Well, it is an, a new experience for you from what you told me and it takes a little while to get used to, but most people find that it becomes a pretty safe, comfortable place. It's actually nice to have someone to talk to. I, I had one of my professors tell me once that therapy is unique and that it's two people focusing on one person. And it's the only relationship in your life where that actually happens, where you don't have to take care of me. I just focus all my time and energy on you. So I'm hoping that you can just let that happen and, and enjoy and benefit from this time we have together. That's a good way to look at it because obviously with a, a spouse relationship, it's more about them than yourself or should be, so. It goes both ways and you really have to consider right. the thoughts and feelings of your spouse, which is part of why you're here. Is that right? That is part of it, absolutely. Um, but the idea of the focusing on one, I can actually draw a parallel with that. When I was doing uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, when I was actually performing surgeries, the whole team, we were focused on that one individual. Uh, obviously, with a different uh, pathway to to a healthy well-being, but still the same basic principle of all these minds working on one. Yeah, Tony, tell me a little bit about how you ended up leaving the Cleveland Clinic. That I I don't know a lot about the different heart clinics around the country, but I know the Cleveland Clinic has an amazing reputation. So I'm just curious about um, what prompted you to make a move to the UW. Well, Cleveland Clinic is uh, recognized as the top game in town uh, in the country for cardiothoracic surgery. Um, I was there for 17 years. I was chief of staff for a number of years. Uh, there was um, Have you ever had held a person's life in your hands? I mean, in your very own hands, where you have the power of life and death over them. That's, that's what that type of surgery is like. And I had a, a young woman, 35 year old woman named Amelia. She was in great health otherwise from this issue. Uh, and she died on the table. There's no reason that we could find that she should have died. It just happened. I couldn't figure out why. Couldn't figure out why. I did nothing wrong. Her family was okay with it. I mean, as well as they could be, but they didn't hold me responsible in any way mm -hmm. because our findings were accurate. The pathology was good. And I guess um, sometime after that, it just seemed to me that I, I needed I needed a change of scenery. And there was an opportunity that came up at the University of Washington and my wife and I bantered back and forth a little bit about it because her family is all there. Mm -hmm. And family is a big thing for her. And I understand that. It wasn't that big of a thing for me. Mine was a little different. But we moved out to Seattle, and so, in a nutshell, that's the reason for coming to the UW. You know, when I hear you tell that story about Amelia, I hear more emotion in your voice than I've heard so far in any of our sessions. So, can you tell me more about the impact that had on you? It sounds like that went really deep. It's it's um, very easy for me to bring up the pain. I still carry the pain of that with me. It's it's there. I can't. I feel that you know, I did everything I could for that woman, and I I failed her. Completely failed her. And there is no excuse for that. I I 
in my line of work, I can't tolerate that kind of behavior. I mean, it sounds cliche, but I, it's, I pride myself in the details of my work, the professionalism and details of my teammates, uh, because that's our, our core existence is to, you know, save people, not to, you know. I know there were a few, there's a thousand other people out there that had a totally different outcome mm -hmm. from our team and from my efforts, but it just doesn't take that away. It, it's, I guess it haunts me would be a good way to say it. Do you tell that story to your students? <laughs> no, I do not. My a big piece of my work as an educator is to instill confidence and give them the best tools they can um, to proceed with what they're going to do. A, a cardiothoracic surgeon that is lacking in the, light, the slightest bit of confidence is, is a detriment to himself and his team and his patients. So I would never, unfortunately, that's one of those things you have to learn on your own time your own experiences. And there are certainly intelligent people, they know the risks as well as the patients do. So I don't bring that up, I don't want them to know. I, um, I try to present myself detailed as a perfectionist, because that's what you have to do to succeed. And I, I don't want to expect anything less from them. So is what happened at the Cleveland Clinic, that awful moment with Amelia, how did that shape your decision to leave the Cleveland Clinic? Because it sounds like when you left the Cleveland Clinic, you not only left that position, but you stopped doing surgery. I guess that in realizing that I had failed her, I failed myself. I made a vow when I was a young man to become a heart surgeon to help people. Because my father died and I felt I could have done something more to save him. But I was, I was in the other room on the phone with my friend Vinny. And my father was in the other room in the kitchen. And by the time I got off the phone from Vinny, I was in there, my father was on the floor. I did CPR, called for an ambulance. And he made it, you know, to the hospital. But in the end of things, he ended up dying. And that's when I made my decision to go into medicine and to make sure that I could do everything I could so someone else wouldn't have to suffer that, that type of death. So I guess that when I, um, when I failed Amelia, I failed my father again. Mm. I don't know. It's, my mind tells me that that's a little obsessive, but it's it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something I can just, you know, flick off my shoulder like a piece of lint. Um, and so, getting back to your root question, leaving the clinic, um, I felt a loss of face with my colleagues because I was pro uno. Mm -hmm. I was the, the leader, and um, just like an athlete, you know, you're past your prime, you're past your prime, and I guess that's how I felt it, about it. So what, what I'm hearing you say is that what happened with your father really impacted you a lot, and you decided at that point that you wanted to 
dedicate your life to saving other people who were having heart problems and do everything possible you could so that they would not die like your father died. You got to the Cleveland Clinic and had a very successful career there until this young woman unexpectedly died during your surgery. And that kind of shattered you. It was not what you expected. It wasn't what you hoped. It wasn't what you dedicated your life to preventing. Or the thing you were trying to prevent actually happened. It was a step backwards. Okay. Yeah, tell me more about that, Tony. What do you mean? Well, here I was saving lives, saving lives. And then someone's life was lost in my hands. So that was... I guess I was right back on the floor of the kitchen with my father. I tried and I tried, but I didn't succeed. And that's... Tony, how old were you when your father died? 19. So you're really young. Yeah. And I was supposed to go into the family business. Uh, but luckily, um, I told my brother what I wanted to do, and he assumed my role in the business, and I went to school. And I went to school until I was 34. Mm -hmm. So it's not, a, it's not an easy road, but it's one that I focused on. Mm -hmm. Went to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, perfectionism. It's what makes you succeed in this business. I don't know if that's a good word or not, but it's just, I don't know any thoracic surgeon or any surgeon of any type, since we're all surgeons before we go into thoracic surgery, mm -hmm. um, can almost come across as arrogant sometimes because they're so full of self-confidence. Mm -hmm. um, highly intelligent people, uh, dedicated, committed, um, hardworking, and you have to have that focus all through. Well, you're, uh, you're a doctor, you know that. Right. <laughs> it doesn't come easy. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. So you, I hear that you've worked really hard. You've dedicated your life to something that's very meaningful to you. And now you've switched to uh, teaching the next generation to follow him in your footsteps. And at the same time, your family's hurting, that your wife is unhappy and your kids feel kind of distant from you. And you've had your own heart palpitations, or I may not say that correctly, of heart arrhythmias, I think. And um, arrhythmias, yes. <laughs> took you to, in to see your own cardiologist. And, um, who suggested you come here. And so here we are. There's definitely been some trauma in your background that's contributed to where you are right now. But what would you like to focus on? What, what's really important to you at this point in your life that we could work on together? Well, I, I can't be a fool and not recognize the validity of my marriage as an important part of my life. Um, I would, I can deal with work. Uh, work at the UW is difficult, it's demanding. But I, I really feel, and it's probably what's causing some of my depression is that I don't relate my family, it's like I'm shirking my responsibility, social responsibilities with my family. I'm, I'm providing, I mean, they can have, get anything they need um, for food and shelter and clothing, those types of things. But I don't feel connected to my kids or my stepson. Um, it's awkward. I'm always tired when I'm home. My wife and I don't have any intimacy. 
she, uh, about the past year, she's been kind of prodding me with the idea of going into counseling, the two of us. And most likely I will, once I evolve from what we are doing together, I'll probably be more accepting towards that because I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to be a fool and not recognize what's going on and not act about it. I mean, that would just be counterintuitive to what I do in my profession. Um, even my brother, for example, Frankie, he lives in Philadelphia uh, still. <laughs> and, uh, it's funny when I think of Philadelphia, I get a little bit of a my old lingo back. <laughs> um, he's going through a bit of a tough time right now, and I've told him that I started to do this, and he said, "Well, are you crazy?" And I go, "Oh, I think I need to do it." Um, so he's like I said, he's having a bit of a tough spot. Would you be interested in in doing this sort of thing with him? Oh, and I could give Frankie you his information. If I would be yeah. able to talk to Frankie. Yes. Well, thank you for because thinking of me, Johnny. I, I appreciate that. But in my profession, we have some pretty strict guidelines, just like I'm sure you do in yours. And one of them is that I have to be licensed in the state where the person I'm helping lives. So... Frankie's in Philadelphia. I can't do it because my license won't allow me to do it. But okay. I could help you find someone for Frankie who could do it for him. Because I think that's a great well, thing that, would be great. that you've shared this with him and that he's open to that and he might be able to get some help too. That would be good. Never had a great relationship with my brother. When it was there, it was, but that's just another piece of the puzzle, I suppose, that could uh, use a little help. How's your relationship with him now? Not like it is with my family, only probably worse. We don't talk that much. Um, we have very little in common, other than the same DNA. He's in a slightly different line of work than I'm in. Um, yeah, what does he do? He's in a construction business. And, um, well, there's some shadier sides to the business that I, uh, I didn't get into, um, that he is still involved with. So I don't really want to discuss that too much, but it's there. Okay. So it sounds like the, there's two themes I'm hearing. Tony, and one is that in, you're really driven at work. You put your heart and soul into it. You feel pain about some really hard things that happen in your life that fuel that fire, your dad's death and then Amelia's death. And you really want to be the best at what you do and you spend hours on your work. And then the other, other line is you're lonely. Your relationships feel pretty empty and people want to be close to you, but there's not much of a connection there. And it's starting to cause some problems because people are, their voices are getting louder and they're saying, especially your wife saying she's not happy. So how do you reconcile those two things? Well, that's, uh, I guess that's the, that's the rub, isn't it? That's the question. How do we go about that? Mm -hmm. So I, I would guess uh, the trick will be to find the elusive balance between work and life. Mm -hmm. 
just have to figure that out. And I guess that's, I guess I'm hoping that that's what uh, I will be able to get out of these sessions we're having. You know, one of the things I'm wondering as I listen to you talk is how many people know the story that you've told me of your life? My wife. And the people at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. I haven't shared that with anyone. It's it's another business really i don't i don't talk about that i don't, I don't want to dwell on the negative it's just a <sighs> but you know my wife says i i need to you know i shouldn't be thinking about it uh, but i can't help what i have it's every once in a while i have a very vivid dream of that situation it happens two or three times a year I, I it's it's just so embedded i can picture myself i can picture the room my teammates and then just the flat line it just it, so i think we definitely need to work on healing for you from that trauma is it's like you said, it's haunting you and it's following you around and it hasn't healed yet. And I think that is something we can do together. We can work on helping you be able to come to peace with what happened in the OR there. And same with the death of your dad. I don't know how many people really understand how devastating that was for you as a, as a really young man. But I think that is such a significant part of your story and healing from these traumas is going to be necessary for you to make a shift in the work-life balance. Because I don't see from what you're telling me that you're working hard only because you want recognition or you want fame or you want an award. What you've talked to me about is that you want to work something through. And part of how you're trying to work that through is through your work. So I'm thinking if we can work that through in a different way, it might be possible to take that, if you're a draw pie chart of your life and the sections devoted to work and to family and to all the other aspects of your life, to shift the balance in that pie chart, I think it's gonna require a shift internally about how you feel about these really hard things that happened over your lifetime. Does that make sense to you? Does that feel right? That, 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 I was just going to say that makes sense, yeah. Uh, recognizing what the problems are and then dealing with them. That's, um, that's the way to tackle it. But that kind of work isn't easy. That type of work in therapy is hard. Is you go back and you face your nemesis or you face what it is that you've been running from for a long time. But I, right. what well, I, I, I guess of you, I don't, I think you can do it. Yeah, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> I don't want to add a, a failed marriage to my, to the list. I don't want to do that. It's, that's actually, even though I'm not doing well at it right now, it's too important to me to let go of that. Yeah, when um, people come to the end of their lives, the things they tend to really look back on and value are their relationships. And most people don't say, oh, I wish I had just spent 30 more hours at the office. Most people say, oh, I wish I had spent more time with so-and-so. Or... <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, it is very true. So I have some books I'll suggest to you that you could read and that might really help. And we'll do some of that. Mind so if I take can, notes? Yeah, so you can learn uh, what it is like to work through trauma. Uh, one of my favorite ones is The Body Keeps the Score. It's a really 
powerful book about how trauma affects people and how it affects their bodies, which might be of interest to so you. So is it as a surgeon. Uh, basically we're talking PTSD? Yeah. Or similar? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I also think we'll start talking about that pie chart of the work-life balance and maybe we can set some goals for how you would like it to be. So I think what I'd like you to do between now and the next time is draw out that pie chart and include work, family, relationship, specifically relationship with your kids, you know, your marriage, hobbies, friends, community activities, and draw one pie chart of how it is, and then draw another one of how you really would like it to be, or you think would be most healthy for you or best for you for it to be. It would certainly be very drastically different. Healthy would probably be drastically different than what it is in reality. So I and think that's... that might give us some direction for our work together is how, how we can move from one of those pie charts to the other. And we can work on coming up with strategies to do that in upcoming sessions. You know, as we come down to the end of this session, that would be something we could do in the future. But let, tell me if that makes sense to you, if that feels right. That's a, a it seems like a rather simple approach. And, and, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, to work with the pie chart and just I can do that and I can I can be thinking of that um, when I'm not in a session you know with you uh, that will help keep it if I actually if I do that that'll help keep it in the forefront of my mind I'll be working on it you know not so much when I'm at work at school but certainly when I'm have a few minutes to just I mean I uh, to be successful, you got to take good notes. <laughs> we all know that from school, and just you have to pay attention to everything. That's that's a detail, and I'll I can put that somewhere where I can see it. You know, like the big, the most important sticky note in my life, I guess. Would be a good way to put it. Yeah, I like that. Okay. So why don't we end here, Tony, for today? And I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. Uh, that sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Lamson. You're welcome. You have a good week. You too. Bye-bye.